Hello, everyone. Welcome here once more to the series of interviews on the life and legacy of Yokoyama Katsuya Sensei. My name is Matheus Ferreira. I'm here for the Kokusai Shakuhachi Kentukan, and it's my pleasure today to have as a guest Dr. Riley Koholi. So, Riley, thank you so much for being with me here today. It's my ple pleasure, Matheus. All right. So, just for our guests here today, I just want to make a little introduction about Riley. So Riley has been a shakuhachi performer or has been performing shakuhachi for over 50 years now. He's one of the most published, I would say, musicians out there with over 60 CDs, 60 albums. Uh, Riley has also was, was, a far, was the first Western to achieve the rank of Dai Shihan Grandmaster. And he lived and studied under Chiko Sakai and Yokoyama Katsuya, two great shakuhachi masters for many years. And besides shakuhachi playing, Riley is also the first non-Japanese to perform the taiko, the Japanese festival drums, with a group called Onde Koza, a group that's now is very much well known as Kodo. He has a PhD degree in ethnomusicology from the University of Sydney, and his PhD thesis, uh, his, his dissertation topic was on the Zen repertoire of the shakuhachi. Riley was the artistic director and chair of the executive committee of the World Shakuhachi Festival, in Australia in 2008, helping connect 400 shakuhachi enthusiasts, participating in many concerts, workshops, forums, and seminars. For all of you listening to us right now, watching us right now, the World Shakuhachi Festival was originally conceived by Yokoyama Katsuya Sensei, his teacher. The first being held in Yokoyama Sensei's uh, place in Bisei, in Okayama, in Japan, in 1994. As you can see, Riley is a very much a uh, very accomplished Sakuhachi professional, player, teacher, and I would say an ambassador and an ambassador for the Japanese music, musical traditions. He lives and performs and teaches in Australia, but it's safe to say that when it comes to spreading Sakuhachi, Riley is global. So, Riley, thank you so much again. It's a pleasure to have this time with you to talk about Sakuhachi and your Sakuhachi journey and also your uh, journey with your parents and say so. Pleasure for me too. All right, so I'd love to start with some simple but basic questions here. So it's been so many years that you have been playing the shakuhachi, but could you share with us a little bit about your early years? I mean, how did you how did you get to know the sound of the shakuhachi and what attracted you to the instrument? My father brought home a Chinese flute that's related to the shakuhachi when I was um, in high school. Um, he, my father was Chinese, so he, um, he taught me a little melody on this inblown flute. So I, I was into inblown bamboo flutes. And this was in the mid 60s, you know, kind of early hippie days. So bamboo flutes were cool anyway. <laughs> and then I happened to be in Japan. Um, I went there once and it was great. And I then went a second time and I was going to be there for about three months. And I thought, well, the second time I should do more than just the tourist thing. And I, so I was going to, oh, I'll, I'll buy a shakuhachi. Um, I forgot to mention that what really interested me, what got me interested in the shakuhachi to begin with was an, an album that um, uh, Yamamoto Hozan was on. Uh, with uh, a clarinetist called Tony Scott and um, I think a, a koto player, I think it was Miasta Tsutsuma and they just improvised and it was all right but um, there was one track that Yo uh, Yamamoto played solo, it was about two and a half minutes on this LP and I just fell in love with it, it just oh. I, I can't express how that music uh, affected me. One of those moments where, you know, I forgot that there was a person playing an instrument and I was listening to that person playing this instrument. It was as if the music was just speaking directly to me. There was no um, disconnection. It was just part of me. I, hard, to, hard to explain it. You couldn't, you know, repeat except by taking off the needle and putting it back on. And I wore out the, that track on my the LP. Just, you know, I wore it down. I, I've just kept playing just that. So that, I had that in my mind. But that's all. I just pick up a flute, pick up a shakuhachi. And 
So I went to buy this flute. Um, uh, I thought buy a shahrachi. Back then you could buy a shahrachi in the department stores. Um, they had very different now. They got rid of that really? a long time ago. But yeah, they had a, the Japanese traditional music section in every department store. So I went to Hankyu department store in Osaka and Umeda in the main station there. And there was this old guy and there was lots of kotos and shamisens and shahrachis all up. And I said, I'd like to buy a shahrachi. So okay, well, you know, there's about 30 of them all lined up on the wall and, and um, well, what do you want? And how much they cost? And back then, because the, the yen was so cheap and the dollar was so valuable, US dollar was very valuable, 360 into the dollar and everything, you know, this was third world country type scenario in, in Japan in 1970. So the cheapest one was about $100. Wow. These were all professionally made shakachis. And the most, the very most expensive flute was five hundred dollars. Which, for for the Japanese, that was, you know, that would be like, fifty, you know, ten thousand dollars now. And I thought, wow. So I mean, I could afford it because I was being paid very well as an English teacher, back when you could, be paid well. Um, what's the difference? And this is what. I think one of the most tur the turning points of my life, there are all these turning points. One was listening to that re record. Is this old man, I mean, he's probably younger than I am now, <laughs> but I thought this, this old guy, he could have just sold me the $500 flute, told me why it was better, right? Yeah. But he looked at me, he, he stopped and he looked at me. You really want to know? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. Well, then you need to go to a teacher. You need to find out yourself and you need to learn. Don't trust me. Would you like me to introduce you to a teacher? And that thought, I'd never thought of that. I didn't want to go to, but I thought, yeah, that's, I guess so. I mean, I want to buy a flute and if you're not going to sell me a flute, unless I got it. So I, I borrowed a flute and he happened to, he just got out a directory, found a, mm -hmm. what he thought it was a really good teacher. It was a Tozan teacher, the best Tozan teacher in, uh, Osaka at the time, Hoshida Ichizan II, uh, and uh, he was my introduction because I couldn't have just gone. I couldn't just knock down the door. Would you teach me? Yeah, you needed an introduction. So he he provided me with. He says, "Look, you really want to know? You got to go through that door, and I've got the key. I'll let you go through, but you got to go through it." I thought, wow. Anyway, so one thing led to another. And then after six months, I went to Sakai Chikaho. And then after, uh, Sakai Chikaho uh, became ill. And I went, went to Yokoyama. And then you know, I, that three months ended up being seven years um, that first time, uh, or first long period in Japan. So it's just, it's, I was in the right place at the right time and being helped by the right people at the right time, too. Well, that's really interesting. So thank you so much for sharing those, those personal stories. Because I mean, it, it's funny that you are mentioning like the first records, right? Or the first songs that you listen, how that connected with you. So for me, of course, was much later in life because in the 70s, you were already in Japan. I was born in 78. <laughs> so for me, the first time that I listened to uh, a Shakuhachi Honkyoko song, Honkyoko song was by Yoko Ewan Sensei playing Yamagoi. And that was the same experience for me, like a similar experience in the sense that that just connected to me. And I also was introduced to a Tozan teacher in Brazil, where I'm from. I thought that was my first, you know, contact there. But my first Shakuhachi album, the first album that I bought was your CD. <laughs> uh, actually, a bootleg copy <laughs> in the streets of Sao Paulo, right? We actually have in Brazil, in Sao Paulo City, we have all these guys sometimes like little stands, you know, yeah. like on the corners selling, yeah. you know, all this kind of stuff. and. When we do, when the police shows up, they, they can wrap everything up really quickly and disappear. And then I came across your Satori CD, mm -hmm. which I know you released in 1983, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, and then I was like, wow. And it was like, the, the, that was the first CD that I bought, the, the wow. first CD ever. And it was really interesting to see that, I mean, your music were just traveling across the globe, you know? <laughs> Uh, people are making copies of it, and I got a chance to connect with your music back then in 2002, I, I think, for me at that time. But I was just curious, uh, curious about that. I mean, 
1983 is just like a few years after you got your Daishi Han rank from, I, I believe, from the Chikuho uh, school, right? Yes. yes. So could you share a little bit with, with us, I mean, what was going on in your life at that time? I mean, were you already a shock, professional shakuhachi player or were you still trying to figure it out, how you're going to be making a, leave, uh, a living out of playing shakuhachi? So, you know, by the mid, after about three or four years playing shakuhachi, I had already decided this is what I was going to do. And um, I, I think that's, you can do that. I guess you could do that anytime. I, I'm, I was, again, so lucky. I was on my own. I had no commitments. Nobody was depending upon me. Um, and so I decided that's what I wanted to do. I hadn't decided how. Mm -hmm. Right, and that did, that thought didn't enter my mind. What, how? Well, whatever it takes, I'll just do it. And in fact, Sakai, when I told Sakai Chikoho, he said, "No, no, you don't, don't." <laughs> he said, he said, "Don't do it." No, he said, "You can't. It's, it'd be impossible." He, but I said, "Yeah, but I'm going to." And then he said, "Okay, well, if you if you're going to, well, here's I can help you." And uh, he said, "I what I, he he could do for me." First, he said, the, uh, this is interesting too, the, 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 the fastest, best way to, to make money playing shakuhachi is teaching and selling licenses. <laughs> because selling licenses becomes uh, like a pyramid system. You know, that, um, say if, if once I become um, like, you know, uh, I, I buy these licenses and, and there's many before you get up to master and grandmaster. And depending, certainly with Chikoho, you don't just buy, buy them. You, you, you know, you, they cost, so you can't just buy them. But once you deserve them, they don't just give them to you, in other words. You pay for what you, for this. Anyway, so, the, and then what happens is then you can teach everybody else. You know, you become a teacher, and they start giving you the money, but you give half of what they give to you back to, to uh, Chikoho. Your teacher. You, yeah. And then, um, and then I, so once I become master, I can teach everyone lower than me. Once I become grandmaster, I can teach people all the way up to master. And then once they become teachers, then they start teaching. I get half of their stuff too. So it's, it, it, it trickles up. It's, a, it's an ideal pyramid system because it's, you're just selling bits of paper. Anyway, it, and when Yokoyama didn't do that at all, he didn't, Yokoyama, until the very end, he didn't really give out uh, licenses. Licenses, yeah. He did toward the end, but he really, he thought, now nah, that was, um, and then he says, okay, Chikaho says, right, well then I'll set you up. You can be the, uh, the head of Kyoto district because I didn't, wouldn't mind living in Kyoto area and, uh, that will give you a little status. Anyway, th that never happened because I joined that Taiko group. And then for the next four years, that was my livelihood. So that was my job. So you could say, um, yes, I was professional shakuhachi because I played shakuhachi in the group. I was a professional shakuhachi player and in that sense, a professional taiko player because I did, that's how I earned my living and that's how I supported myself by doing that full time. So that was that. Was that. And then after I left uh, and I came back to, uh, um, to Hawaii, by that time I had met Patricia, uh, who's, you know, Patricia and I have been now married for about 40, coming up 43 years. Um, I still thought of myself as a shakuhachi player, but, it, but you know, I still had to do other jobs at, in the beginning. I, I couldn't earn my living entirely playing mm -hmm. shakuhachi, but I immediately started teaching. And again, opportunities just fell into my lap. Um, I, I, I didn't really have to hustle too much, you know, other than in the beginning, playing 12 hours a day, you know, practicing. A lot of practice. <laughs> but, you know, people, they ask you, oh, shakuhachi is so hard. I say, no, it's not. Doing something you don't enjoy, that's hard. Doing something you enjoy all day long, that's not hard. You know, get, becoming good at playing the shakuhachi is time consuming. Mm. But I want to, so the, the hard thing for me has always been not, playing the shakuhachi, the hard thing for me is finding the time to play the shakuhachi because everything else 
you know, is impinging on me. And of course, uh, once you have a family and, and start thinking, you have to, you know, put Your food on the table. Yeah. You have to compromise. You have to do certain things that you don't necessarily want to do that takes away from your practice time and your performing time. But that's another issue. So that's was my space. You know, that's where I was at the time. The recording that Satori, you know, that only that just some this guy just came up to me. I don't know who he heard. Heard, you know, I was trying to play as much as I could. I any time, anywhere, anybody asked me to play, I would. I I didn't turn down anything. I would play just, no matter what. You would say yes and just do it. I would I would do that. I would try to play as much as I could in front of people. And he said, let's could let's do some recording. So we just I recorded. Uh, it was just this his own four track kind of open reel stereo in the back of the in, in the you know the shed in the back garden. And uh, that was where that satori uh, happened. You know? So it was, it was pure luck in my my case. Yeah, I didn't go out and seek him. He and then his company was bought out by another company that became very successful. And, you know, that wasn't my anything I did. It's just I was kind of riding the coattails of these other people. You're just like flowing with it. Well, I, you know, I was when opportunity uh, arose, I, you know, when the doors were there, I, I made decisions and opened doors and I took the risks. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't so hard to take a risk because I was, um, you know, I was kind of focused I you know I, that's what I wanted to do of course I'm going to do that you know I'll deal with the consequences afterwards and I was I've been very very lucky yeah thank you so much for sharing some more of the, the stories behind your recordings and what was happening at the time that's actually very insightful and fun to hear because for me I mean like you know trying to learn from your journey as a shakuhachi student at the time but also becoming a professional and a performer uh, very very interesting thank you so I want to go back to I mean, your two main teachers, right? Uh, Kiko Sakai and Yokoyama Hatsuya. We also know as Shakuhachi students and players, which is my case, right, as a Shakuhachi student, it's quite hard to study two different lineages, two different schools. So I was wondering what made, I mean, of course, uh, Chiko Sakai passed away, as, as you mentioned, but what made you kind of get in contact with Yokoyama's style of playing? I mean, what I mean, how, how, how did that go between, you know, like the first lineage that you were studying and then going to Yokoyama's style? So as I mentioned that that two and a half minutes of Yamamoto Hozan inspired me to, to start the Shakuhachi to begin with. The second single recording that inspired me the most was Yokoyama. And he uh, and particularly this uh, piece that I'm sure you're familiar with, San'an, Safe Delivery. Uh -huh, yes. And I just love that. And I, I uh, bought that recording and, and listened to the music um, while I was still studying with Chikoho. And I always wanted to learn that. It was always in the back of my mind, I've got to learn this. And I didn't know when or how because back then you didn't swap teachers. It was just not the thing to do. Uh, and um, But I, I knew that I was going to eventually. It's just a matter of time. Fortunately for me, of all the teachers in Japan, Sakai Chikoho and Yokoyama Katsuya were two that were the least concerned about being in the single lineage. Mm. And I often think about that, why? And um, I, I used to think, well, it's because they were so good, they, you know, they didn't have anything, they weren't worried, they, weren't, they didn't have to protect themselves, they didn't have to, they, you know, they weren't going to lose face. You know, they were very comfortable with themselves and but then I, I know of other teachers who are and players who one could argue were equally or are equally um, skilled as a musician, equally uh, inspiring as a musician and teacher that are still very strict or were very strict about that sort of thing. So that wasn't it. I think partially it was just their personality. In any case, Yokoyama uh, was, he was easy. He didn't want to upset the other teachers, but on the other hand, he wasn't going to um, say, no, 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 you mustn't study with me, he would say, well, you know, if it's okay with your teacher, it's okay with me. And Sakai 
it was friends with Yokoyama, and so Sakai would say, yeah, if you want to study with Yokoyama, please. It turned out that I never had to ask that because I joined the Taiko group. I was no longer living in Osaka, in Osaka anyway, and then um, Chikoho got sick. So then I asked Yokoyama um, if he would teach me because it was, you know, it was, it was kind of, uh, I didn't have, you know, I didn't have to ask Chikoho because he wasn't teaching anymore. So that was, uh, uh, it was, I was again. It was it was very easy and luck fortunate for me. And was it was it really easy for you just to find uh, Yokoyama to say at that time? I mean, how did you make that connection? Again, I was so lucky. You know, back then you could count the number of shakuhachi players that you know non-Japanese shakuhachi players. Maybe not on one hand, but on both hands. But I knew very small everybody. Group. I knew everybody, and there were. I did, you know, there are a few that would come and go. I didn't know everybody, but I knew all the, the, the dedicated ones. You know, all the ones like David Wheeler and Christopher Blaisdell, and, and there was a few, you know, quite a few others. And also there were very few of, amongst the, the non-Japanese um, players, there were very few that was as, as kind of fanatical as, as I was, or as, the, you know, the other, again, Christopher and, and, and David were. So Yokoyama knew about me. You know, you go, there's a Shakuhachi concert of students, there's a hundred students of Chikoho. Who do you remember? You remember the weird gaijin, right? <laughs> right. And so I was introduced to Yokoyama. I met Yokoyama, I met Yamamoto Hoza, I met Aoki Reiba, I met um, wow. uh, Yamaguchi Goro, went to Yamaguchi Goro's house because it was a small world and it became even smaller when you were a foreigner and were back then there were very very few foreigners that could speak Japanese that was so involved in the shakuhachi and once I joined the, the taiko group again I, my, I became even more well known because the group was well known and of course yeah, again yeah. who do you remember in the group you remember there was all these taiko players but there's you know there's the white the, guy <laughs> yeah the white guy playing the shakuhachi so yeah, I knew I knew Yokoyama, so all I had to do was ask him at the time. He was just right there. And how many years, right, have you studied with, with Yokoyama Sensei? How many oh. years have I? Yeah, as a student of Yokoyama, how many years have you, were you able to study? Well, you know, him? I had a few little kind of lessons that I, but I kind of officially became a student, um, I forget, 80, 80, um, 3, 84, around there, maybe 84. 84. Early 80s, I think. Here, here's, a, here's an interesting story. So I kind of officially became a, a student of, of Yokoyama. And I knew a lot of his, his students already. In fact, some of his students I had were previously studied, previously studied with Sakai. And uh, there was one guy, uh, Ichiro Seki, Seki-san. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, I taught his parent, I taught his father English, you know. Well, <laughs> he, he, lived in, he lived in Nishinomi in, be, between Osaka and, and, and Kobe. This shows you how small this world was. I taught his father just because his father was interested in learning English. He didn't need it. And, um, but he, it, I, I did that because I knew Seki san from being a student by Shakuhachi playing. And uh, so, and then Seki-san went to Tokyo and became a student of Yokoyama. And I met all the other, I met, you know, Furia and the other guys, these old, way back then. So it was, wasn't like I was, I, you know, I was, I was known and I knew people. But I remember there was kind of the official day, we were just in uh, Yokoyama Sensei's apartment uh, where, you know, where he taught, it's kind of quote unquote dojo, but it was just a room in his apartment. And, you know, okay, we're, you're officially now, we're going to uh, officially invite you and, and uh, Furia or somebody says, and, and as a token of our welcome, you know, Yokoyama was just sitting in the back. It was the students basically. Welcoming you into our community, we'd like to give you a gift. And I thought, oh, wow, that's cool. I mean, I, we give gifts, you know, I, I had a yeah. gift. Yeah. But it was, you know, I forget, it was a cake or something. You're always giving gifts. 
um, I, I had to give a gift when I left the other teachers, you know, when I left the uh, Hoshiri Institute, I, I gave a gift and explained things. So that, the gift itself wasn't a, a, a surprising. But anyway, I opened it up and it was back then, it, it was a tuner and it was about this big and it wasn't automatic. You had to switch every note, you had to switch. And I knew those things were very expensive back then. You know, mm. it was very expensive. So I was stunned. I thought, wow, this is so good. And I thought, wow, you know, well, you know, I realized a lot of this extra kind of stuff I get is just not because of me, it's because I'm a, a, a gaijin, a foreigner, and, you know, I shouldn't get too, uh, too, you know, be too proud about receiving this gift. But I wonder if everyone, you know, gets the gift as good as this, you know. I, I thought to that myself. I was very pleased. And of course, I used it a lot. And then later on, when the new ones came in that were automatic, you just play mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, now you just get a, it's on your phone. But back then, it was quite something. And it was only maybe 10 years later that I, looking back, I thought, you stupid Riley, stupid you. Yokoyama had. Furia and the other guys give me a tuner as a polite way of saying and as a means of improving my lousy pitch. <laughs> 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 and in part, I have to, I have to, you know, to, um, uh, in a sense, to be fair, uh, Chikaho didn't care about pitch. Mm. You know, his pitch was, it was more the Mion style. It wasn't that important. Mm. Yeah. And, and there's a certain uh, beauty to that, too, where the, the E flats are not quite E flat. And so you can't say that my pitch was wrong when I was in the Chikaho world. Yeah. But if you're going to enter the Okuyama world, okay, you got it. It's a different thing. So that was great. Uh, no, that, that's so interesting and funny. I mean, that, a very Japanese way of just saying, hey, just like work more on your sound, right? <laughs> yeah, of course, Yokoyama did say that. <laughs> always. Um, yeah, I mean, pitch control for him was, was a big thing, right? It's like always like, really, really paying a lot of attention to your sound. And speaking about sound, right, I mean, you mentioned that Sanan was a piece that also you wanted to learn that piece. Uh, but when you compare, you know, all the different um shakuhachi players and all the greats that you got to meet back in the day what actually in your perception made yokoyama sound so distinct i mean what, what, what if you could define in your own words what was unique about yokoyama sound okay so you know you, we have to be careful with our definitions here so you yeah. could talk about sound or you could talk about his playing or his music and the sound he makes is is one thing but there's other things like uh, um, um, how loud he plays the sound or what's mm -hmm. the tone color of the sound or what pieces does he play so just honing in on the sound his tone color was different from others okay and then and then broadening it out a bit okay his his the way he played phrases um, his um, durations were different. And broadening out a bit more when you talk about pieces, um, it, or, or you could even say in the phrases too, not just the duration, but his use of dynamics were different. He had a broader range of dynamics, I think. Um, and then you can be in more specific how he ends the phrases were slightly different. And all these differences are not necessarily better than the other teachers. I just liked them more. They attracted me more. Then finally, um, he played different pieces. So San An wasn't performed by anybody else. Only he had San An. Uh, you know, he got from Watatsune, his teacher. So I was attracted to Yokoyama from both a, a micro and a macro level. I liked how he sounded and on many different levels. I liked how he phrased how he put those sounds into phrases, and I liked the pieces that he played. I liked the repertoire that he had. And then once I got to know him, I just liked also him as a person. I liked what he was on about. I liked 
the fact that it seemed to me that there was more there than just playing. There was more than just the music. He was doing it on a, a, a deeper level. He could teach me more than just how to play the shakuhachi, which he did. Um, so that, I, you know, I was attracted to him on, on, on so many levels. Well, thank you so much. I mean, because I mean, one of the one of the main goals of this series of interviews is actually to get to you know others that will never have the chance to meet you, Quermans, and say you know to get them to know through the eyes of his direct students. So I think what you just shared is just is just so beautiful because it gives us a little bit of a of a glimpse into 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 the man and the player, right, the teacher, and in so many different layers, as you put it. So. I just would like to unpack a little bit here uh, in some aspects of what you just shared. So number one, um, so how did that shape your sound? I mean, looking at your 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 style of playing and the Chikuho and Yokoyama style, did that? I mean, did you have to make a, a choice, or did I mean, did you just make made a synthesis of both? I mean, how would you define your own style of playing, given that you had those two great teachers? I've always tried to sound like Yokoyama and very, very early on, I have always realized that that's impossible. Why is that? I'm not Yokoyama. For a start, you know, there's a, 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 a kind of a, it's, it's partly a joke, but it's partly, um, it, it's told, it's a joke that's for real sort of thing. I don't mm -hmm. know if you knew that Yokoyama, when he was about, 12 or so, you know, he, his father was a shakuhachi player and his father typically was assuming that Yokoyama was going to become a shakuhachi player and, and his father was a very famous maker as well. And uh, so he just thought Yokoyama would follow in his footsteps. And so, which makes sense because, you know, as a kid he would be playing around with, you know, as a baby he would be mucking about with pieces of bamboo and as a, he would be hanging out with his dad in the work. So in other words, he it makes sense. When he was about 12, he was on a ladder changing a light bulb and fell down, fell off the ladder and split his lip. Mm. And uh, his father at that time just said, well, there goes his career as a shakuhachi player because it was a really bad cut, you know. And so now everybody says, well, you know, in order to really sound like that real rough kind of beautiful guttural, just very rich sound of Yokohama, you got to bust your lip. <laughs> you got to have this imperfection in, in your lip, mm. otherwise you're not going to get it. So in other words, you can't sound like someone else, just like it's very hard uh, to sound like uh, someone's voice. I mean, there are yeah. people that do that, that can imitate people, but they're, you know, they're, they're, they have a certain, they practice doing that, and, and they have a certain ability to be able to do that, to sound just like someone else. I don't know if, if it's harder to sound like someone's voice than it is to sound like someone's shakuhachi playing. I don't know. Back then, be, because only the top guys, because it was so expensive, only the top guys re, uh, released any recordings. So uh, unlike now, anyone can record. And anyone can not only record, but they can put it up on YouTube. So. Uh, back then, if you if there was a recording, if if you could buy a recording, you knew already that this guy is is either really good or really wealthy, you know, because there were a few. You can still publish it yourself if you wanted to. So you can't imitate that, you know. I'm not like that, right? Like I don't sound like him, and none of the other. I could recognize what I was going to say. I could recognize everyone's. Who, who was playing? As soon as I heard it on the radio or recording, you put anything on and I would say, that's so-and-so, mm -hmm. rather than that, right? It's impossible to do that, now you can't. And part of the reason is a lot of people, they sound very similar these days, but uh, it's, as, you, as you know, you, the shakuhachi, one of the things that attracts people to the shakuhachi is, it's, you know, the instrument is so much a part of, of you. You are part of the instrument, I should say. So what's happening be, uh, from the lips back is so much a part of the sound. It's not just the, the so I can take a, any flute and I'll still sound like me. Yeah. And I can give you all of my flutes and you'll still sound like you. You won't sound like me. Right? You can't say that with, say, a piano. 
You know, a good piano will sound like a good piano, certainly note for note. But that's not true even for a single long tone. You know, a, a, a long tone robuki will still sound like, you know, Kaki Zakai Sensei's robuki will sound different from mine, even if he says, here, you try now. And it's, it's not better. They, they're not necessarily better. They're just different. They're different. So I knew I couldn't do it, but I still aspired to. I also think I was, of course, studied intensely with Chikaho, and, and he influenced my sound, obviously, just like how I talk has been influenced by the sounds that I hear around me. I don't think I sound, I, you know, I, I know I don't sound like Yokoyama, and I probably don't sound that much like Sakai Chikaho. So, I, you know, how do I describe, well, I just sound like me. And I have to accept that, you know, I wish I could sound more like Yokoyama, and I try to at least get the durations and the tone and, and, and the timing that's duration. Durations and volume and pitch. I can sound like Yokoyama on those levels, but the tone color, I can try. I can make the, the Rho Daimetis sound like Yokoyama's Rho Daimetis. Um, and occasionally I, I, you know, approach that sound. But um, Yokoyama once, not once, m many times, but one of the things that Yokoyama taught me um, was that you, if you have a life goal, and, and this a lot of people say that in different ways. People they talk about you should have your goals like a pyramid. You've got a lot of little goals at the bottom that you may be able to, to accomplish today. And then you've got the next level maybe this week and the next level this month, and it changes. And the further up you go, the pyramid of your goals, the fewer goals there are, and the harder it is to get up there, the longer it takes to get up there. And you're always changing. So a lot of these goals will knock off, but they're all, all the goals are leading up to the one final goal. That's, that's, so all these goals are supporting that one final goal. And that one final goal is your lifetime goal. And he says, okay, but here's the thing. A lifetime goal is only worthy of being a lifetime goal if it's impossible. Mm. What? Why have a goal if it's impossible? And it's not that it's impossible, that you know it's impossible. You know, you may not, you may pick a goal that you think is possible, and it's not. No, 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 you got to pick a goal that you absolutely, positively sure is impossible. That's your lifetime goal. Why? Because if you don't pick a goal that's impossible, what happens if you get it? What happens if you reach it and you're still alive? Then you have no purpose in life. Yeah, and this is what happens to particularly like Olympic gold medalists. They have nervous breakdowns. They become alcoholics. You know, things go pear-shaped. And just because a lifetime goal, in fact, because a lifetime goal is impossible and you're always striving, that makes it worthy of being a lifetime goal. Because ultimately, and this is the paradox, the lifetime goal is to always be striving toward an impossible goal. It doesn't matter what it is. As long as you're striving, it's not getting the goal, it's not attaining the goal, it's not reaching the goal. It's the striving that's important. And so, wow. you know, yeah, right, you're never gonna, you're never gonna get there, you know, and then you die. And that's only okay if you realize, yeah, the getting there is not important. The getting there is just so that you can focus on where you're going. So you're not kind of all over the place. It's just a focus. It doesn't matter what you focus on. You just focus. I mean, hey, we're just talking about blowing into a piece of bamboo. I mean, how? <laughs> so that's, that's uh, you know, that's, my goal is to sound like Yokoyama, and I never will. No, thank you. Well, wow, thank you so much for that, because I mean, that's really inspiring to, to me to listen to the, the way you just so beautifully described um, all, all that you, you just shared. Because for me, two things just stood out. One, that you, through your, your Shakuhachi journey, you just found your own voice with the bamboo, yeah. right? So yeah. 
and at the same time, and that's the, the complexity of it, you have that aspirational impossible goal of like sounding like Yokoyama and, and you know for a fact that that's not a, even like physically as you were describing, it's not a possibility. Yeah. But, but the journey and the process, right? That keeps you going as well. It just keeps you inspired to keep playing and to keep honing your sound. Yeah. Another interesting thing about this idea of the impossible goal is on the one hand, you're always going to strive for it. But on the other hand, because you know you're never going to reach it, you, you kind of, in other words, you have no expectations. You, you have relax. aspirations. So instead of expectations, which then lead to disappointment, because when you expect something and it doesn't happen, you get disappointed. You have aspirations you're aspiring to. But if you don't make it, it doesn't matter. So it becomes more like a game. You know, it's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm having fun reaching toward this impossible goal that I know I'm never going to get. So it doesn't matter that I don't get it because I know I'm never going to get it. And yet it's, it's really a matter of life and death. So it's not like it's unimportant. It's my most, it's why I, I get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's like you say, it's, it's, it's my life motivation. So how much more important is that? It's extremely important. But there's less disappointment. Yeah, and, and so for then me, when I fail, when I fail, sorry to, to interrupt. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead, please. And ask. Yeah. When I fail, it's not a failure. It's just another step toward there. It's a learning process. It's a it's a it's an opportunity. And it, you know, these are all cliches. Everyone's saying this. You know, we all know this stuff. And I've just been very lucky to be given this tool uh, that. Um, you know, allows me to, 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 to make these sort of cliches, you know, real. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I think that you're just bringing like, uh, you're just bringing back to, to reality, be, being read down to earth, because I can relate as a Shakuhachi student. I mean, how many times I just want to pick up that piece of bamboo and just throw it out of the window, right? Because I was just so frustrated, so disappointed. But what it's really inspiring for me here listening to you is that by having that specific type of attitude or, or predisposition, you, what you're, you're also speaking to me about having some likeness in that striving, you know, in that dedication, in that effort. So I think that's also a very important, important um, aspect of Shakuhachi learning to cultivate as you know, yes. kind of walk this journey. Otherwise, you're just going to be in this journey making yourself miserable. And that's, and that's no fun. I mean, I don't, I don't see a point to that. That's an interesting thing. Uh another quality that attracted me to Yokoyama, not just his playing, but as a person, and but particularly as a teacher, he was much stricter than Sakai Chikoho. He was extremely strict, very, very strict. And he would just completely, utterly destroy me in his criticism sometimes. But he'd always do it with a, a smile. So on the one hand, you know, come on, get it right. Get it right. Don't waste my time. You know, but you know, it doesn't really matter. You know, so uh, unless you, you can criticize, it's this, it's, it's like you say, it's the, you know, the, the um, life or death importance, strictness with the lightness. Mm. It, com the combination. He was the most strict. He was, well, I had another, the guy that was running, um, that started the, the Taiko group. He was like that too. Strict as, you know, a real bastard. You know, real, not, Yokoyama was, was less of a, of a you know, a, 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 a dictator than, than, the other guy, Bin Song, was, but they both, they, were, they had this laughter. They had this, you know, you know, joy behind them. So it's that you don't want, don't, don't mess around, you know, but you got to relax. You got to play. You got to have fun. You got to be light about it, but don't do it sloppily, which doesn't mean you've got to play intensely. You know, it doesn't mean you have to spend all your time, you know, this, that and the other. 
Whatever you do, do it with intent and awareness. And maybe that's what it boils down to. You know, you at least be aware. If you're going to be angry, you're, you're aware of your anger and you use your anger. If that anger will help your student, for example, in Yokoyama's case, get better, then don't tap it down. Don't, you know, don't not get angry. But don't be attached to the anger. Don't get angry because you're, anger. you're angry. Don't show that anger just because you've let go of your emotions. You know, you be, be, be aware, and, and when, if you're aware of it, you can control it. Be aware of your sound. Be aware of if you, your pitch is off. And then you can control that pitch. How? Why? Well, well then you've got to set your goals. Why do you want to be aware of this? Why, where do you want to go? So it, it's all, this is, I'm, I'm kind of throwing things out very um, no, randomly. Great. But this is an example of what I'm trying to express is how Yokoyama Sensei and just teaching how to play a, a bamboo flute uh, was really just teaching me how to live. You know, so it, it, it was, um, you know, a big deal. <laughs> Very big deal. Sure thing, but I think this is actually a very good segue here to another point that I just would like to explore with you because, as you know, many Westerners kind of get drawn to the shakuhachi because of this connection between shakuhachi and Zen, right? Mm -hmm. And what you're just describing right now for me is a very, you know, down to earth Zen type of approach about, you know, being aware, being aware of your emotions, being aware of your body, be aware of your sound. You know, keep polishing. You know, don't 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 tap out. Don't give up. It's hard, and you need to learn how to live with all of that and navigate through your own self and your personal challenges. And the bamboo is, is, is one of those tools, right, that to help you to mirror back your inner world back at yourself. And I'm just saying that because, and feel free, please, to disagree or just to bring this into a different direction, but. So many people just, they look at the shakuhachi with this aura of Zen, right? And almost in a very, uh, uh, almost thought if it was like this big fantasy around, you know, the myths of the, you know, like uh, wandering monks in the mountains and whatnot. But what you're describing to me is a very practical way of understanding shakuhachi and inner work. Does that, does that, does, does that resonate with you? I, it does. And I think I can even elaborate on what you're describing and what I see myself is there are many people who pick up the shakuhachi as a spiritual tool, as a way of meditating, and um, they, they can't play. You know, it, it's, it, it's, it, to my ears, it sounds horrible. And partly their instruments are lousy and, and partly they're, they just, they're not, learning the technique and then they would say well that's music i'm doing this for, because of zen i'm not doing this because of music i don't want to become a musician i want to become i want enlightenment or i want i want to use this as meditation yeah yeah fine that's okay however if you're going to use the shakuhachi as a tool then you need to become familiar with your tool if you're going to use the honkyoku as meditation, you got to really understand honkyoku. If you, um, the, 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 the purpose of, of Zen Buddhism is um, not to become good at anything per se. It's not to become good at playing shakuhachi. It's not to become good at um, being, uh, having a business you know, and earning money. It's, it's not about that. It's about developing the ability to, to be, be aware of things and to, and to concentrate. And then to contemplate on what you're concentrating on and to and then there are certain kind of things that I think one finds out about uh, one's existence. For example, that, you know, I'm just here because I'm lucky. It's not because of my own efforts, really. The Zen practitioner, say the, the you know the Zen monks that that um, in Japan are are uh, 
who I would call pretty enlightened guys, you know, they, they've been staring at their wall for 40 years, 50 years. Yes. And they've been doing that for, you know, six, eight hours a day. And you think, my goodness, they must, you know, if they're so enlightened, why do they have to keep doing it? And, and the, the point is, 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 again, what I was saying, you know, they're, they're not doing it to reach a goal. They're doing it because that's, that's what they want to do. That's their thing. They really, really, really enjoy sitting and staring at walls. And I won't go into the reason why. You sound like, how could you enjoy that? Well, there's, there's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's a lot more than that. But in other words, you never, you never, um, you never reach the end. But they're really good, and they're focusing on something. And if you want to use, if you, if, if what you, you're really interested is in doing, you know, understanding why they can sit and stare at a wall for forty years, eight hours a day. Probably it's best to do that, not play shakuhachi. Shakuhachi gets in the way. But on the other hand, you can attain, you can reach the, 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 the understanding or whatever you want to call it, the enlightenment that they reach with anything. You can do that. Well, you know, they, used, they garden a lot. You can do that gardening. Yeah, yeah. You can do that. Um, uh, I just... There was a guy on, on television here in Australia the other day, and he was a forklift driver all his life. And um, he, was, uh, he, 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 wasn't, he, he couldn't read. You know, he, didn't, he never had the education. He never had the opportunity. Um, and um, so he, he drove forklifts all day. He was retired. You know, when he, but anyway, I was listening to him talk, and, and he was interacting with these four-year-olds. You know, and I thought, wow, this guy's he's pretty cool. He's really, you know, I wouldn't mind hanging out with this guy. He, he's just, so, you, you know, whatever you do, I bet he was a great forklift driver. You know, I bet he was a superb forklift driver. And he obviously will make, a, a, you know, the superb kind of sir. He was becoming a, this, the whole point was he was a kind of adopted grandfather of this four-year-old that didn't have a grandfather. Uh, yeah, he's going to be really good at that. He was really living the life, you know, that I guess you would expect. And yet he was also, he was, you know, he knew he, he'd lost all, he can't read, he can't read for God's sake. And he knew he was, this is sad. So yeah, you, if you play shakuhachi for, for meditation, this is the final thing because I'm rabbiting on. Okay, well fine, do that, but don't play it in front of anybody else. Don't ever, ever record it. Don't ever, ever play it with anybody there because you don't do that when you meditate. You d meditation is not a spectator sport. You know, oh, the Dalai Lama's in town. He's coming. He's, he's going to meditate at the, uh, the Olympic Stadium. You know, there's going to be 150,000 people there. I got seats. You want to go see him, watch, watch him meditate? You know, that isn't going to happen. That doesn't happen. <laughs> You know, it just does not happen. Fantastic. Fantastic. If you want to play it in front of somebody, well, then you're, you're, you're doing music and get good at the music. And don't use the idea that it's meditation as an excuse for not getting the technique right. If, if you want to play out a tune like Chikaho, because that's how it sounds and that's how they do it, okay, fine. But you're aware of that. Uh, Kurahashi Sensei, another uh, well-known person, he's, he's a bit like me. He's, he's got a, this lineage on one hand, and he's got, um, so he's, he, can, he can play Western pieces in perfect Western pitch. He can play Kinko-style Honkyoku in perfect Kinko pitch, which is the minor seconds are a little bit different. And then he can play these uh, Mioan pieces with their pitches, which is more like Chikoho, which is where the the, the Tsumeris, the, 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 they're wider, they're different. And he chooses to do that depending on the context. Yeah, he can hear it. He, he makes that, he's, he's aware of it and he makes the choice. And he does it and he does it all very well. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to play in front of somebody, we'll do it you know, with the awareness. And if you want to play it, um, 
and again, if you if you if you want to use these uh, lousy instruments, you know these homemade instruments that are really hard to play and they're out of tuner, fine. But do it like Watatsumi did it. He still played in his in pitch. He still played them, you know, musically, even though he didn't care about music. You know, th this is now getting past Wata Yokoyama, but Watatsumi. I don't know if you know the story, and stop me if you have. Of, no, no, please go. He, he became very famous through Yokoyama's efforts. And there was, uh, uh, there was going to be this all-star, this is back when Shakachi was extreme, really popular amongst uh, college students age, you know, young people. And, it, and this promoter in it for the money, he, he got this all-star cast of the top Shakachi players in, in the world, which are all Japanese, in this one concert. And the tickets were expensive and he got, Yoko, uh, Yoko, he got Watatsumi. Watatsumi is going to play a piece. And so Watatsumi goes out there and he just did this demonstration with stick fighting. And the promoter was ropeable. The promoter was like, you know, he, Watatsumi came, what the, you, you know, I paid you all this and you, and, and Watatsumi looked at him like, what are you on about? What's the difference? Ooh, and you know, Watatsumi okay. could do that because in his mind, it, he, it really was on the same level. He was doing both on the same level. Okay, now we could tell that story and we could say, well, yeah, it's no different now. I don't need to play shakachi. It's no different. No, 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 no. You got you to gotta be able, to, it's almost like, um, I don't know, James Joyce or Dylan Thomas. You got, you know, you know they, these are, or, 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 they, they, they write in English, but man, their English is not using grammar in the way that I was taught to, to speak and write. It's all over the place. But a non-native English speaker who doesn't understand grammar couldn't write that way. Yeah. You've got to yeah. learn the yeah. rules yeah. in order to... Relate to that. <laughs> You've got to learn the rules in order to give up the rules, in order to, to throw away the rules. You've got to know those rules first. And so don't... It's not... A, it's, anyway, that's... No, this is, this is really good, right? Thank you so much for, for sharing your wisdom there because actually you, you just put me in some quiet, reflective space here about so many things about Shakuhachi and my own Shakuhachi journey. And, and I got to say that I want to go back to one specific moment in time where I could have a, an actual experience in Japan about some of those things that you're just describing. I remember going to a temple in Kyoto because there was the Shakuhachi festival happening there at the time, 2012, right? And a bunch of these players got together in this gathering. And I, and I, I thought, oh, this is really cool, right? So let me just go there and they were playing for a whole day. And I gotta be honest, I mean, it was excruciating. It was the most painful thing to listen to in my life. And I was with a couple other friends and they were all like a little perplexed because should we be liking this? I mean, you know, like we didn't know how to react. We were a little bit at a loss. But then for me, exactly what you were describing, I mean, I saw a bunch of players that could not manage their emotions. You know, they could not manage their anxiety. They could not manage their stage fright. And they're just trying to offer something that they clearly could not master. They clearly could not handle. And the experience was just horrible. And we laughed after, I know, a couple hours. And I think that, I don't know if it was the same night or next night we had a master's concert. And I remember, of course, watching and listening to beautiful performances. But I remember your performance that day because I was there. And... And I remember the way you entered the stage. I mean, the level of your awareness and, and body presence. I, mean, I, I was really actually drawn to that because the way you actually had your flute in, your, in, the, back, in the back of your, uh, in your back and you move it and you play it beautifully. But I was particularly drawn by the way you were ending your lines and especially your last line when your sound was just dissolved into, into nothingness, you know? But it was just so beautiful. And then I could definitely fee, feel and experience all of that effort and dedication to hold and to polish and your skillfulness around it. And that for me was very insightful to see you and other players that day because it was, I, I just went, that's it. You know, that, that my impossible, that's my impossible goal, you know, in some kind of way for me here, from my place. But it was a clear difference from people that they say they want to use Shakuhachi as a spiritual tool but then they just play crappy and sloppy and they offer that to people. And I, and I don't think that should be an offering to your point, right? 
I mean, what you guys play there, the Masters concert, that's an offering. And I think that's a, a very different way of looking at things. I'm, I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong, but I think you, you've got to know where you're coming from because I agree with you. And yeah, what does the story? It, it, it just explains a lot, right? So you don't have to just pretend that you are a shakuhachi player if you're just playing for yourself and then you're actually promoting this weird image about shakuhachi and zen, shakuhachi and spirituality, and then compare yourself to a musician, uh, a professional player that dedicated so many years of his or her life to achieving that level. And I think that making that distinction is, is quite important. So thank you so much for, for covering that, that topic. Could I uh, just uh, further that story yeah. that you just said? So on the one hand, the people that were, you know, that signed up to be able to perform in that all day concert in, in uh, the temple, Mion, Mion Temple, and they were obviously in your eyes not prepared in the sense that they became uh, nervous and they didn't play very well. And it was, it's, it's hard um, to watch someone kind of fall apart in, in embarrassment, you know, because you become embarrassed as a, as a, in the audience. But on the other hand, in the context of the temple, in the context of, of Zen, okay, they are doing what they're doing and whether or not they were prepared or not, or, or even their understanding is not the same thing as you as the listener. And you, me, so me as the listener, uh, if I'm aware of, of the fact that, you know, these guys, you know, they, th it's really important to them. And for whatever reason that they can't perform well because they haven't practiced enough and, and you have to practice performing in order to get good at performing. You know, you can become very good at practicing so you can play in your own room and, and still fall apart. Uh, you know, in front of an audience, because there's two separate things. You know, playing your shakuhachi on your own is not performing. It's a different thing. Um, so you got to practice that. And so, as a as the as a member of the audience, I'm first. I'm 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 giving them the opportunity to reach their goal as a performer. I'm allowing them to perform in front of me. So, they. Uh, you know, I can do that. I, 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 I'm gener I think I I'm, should be generous enough to give my time to let these people, you know, it's so important to, to them to do that. Okay, you know, I'm, it's, I'm, I'm here not for my own enjoyment, I'm here because I'm helping them. And by my thinking of that, in fact, helps me let go of myself too, because I, you know, it's not about me. It's it's you know, it's about them. You know, what can I do to help them? Yeah, I, I don't need to. I don't need to receive anything. I just want to give. And on the other hand, also, you, when you think of a performance, a performance is to give. It's giving. Um, it, it's actually the the original French word is is uh, it's to fulfill an obligation. You know, mm -hmm. to, to to follow through and fulfill an obligation. Is, is the original part of the original meaning of the word and they're trying and and uh, they're they're trying to uh, fulfill an obligation sometimes they're trying to give and and they're, they're doing as best they can but they're like toddlers that fall fall down and just like I don't expect the toddler to be able to run like you know um, um, what's, that? what's that? I forget the mind Who's the guy that uh, Hussein B Bolt? Yeah, Hussein Bolt. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I don't expect my, you know, one and a half year old um, granddaughters to be able to to run like Bolt. They're doing the best <laughs> they enough. can. Yeah, they're Fair doing enough. the best they can, and um, I, I'm not expecting these guys that are playing in, in that concert to um, to even understand this. You know that you know they really shouldn't be there. But, you know, hey, they're, they're, they're there. And so, in other words, yes, you're right. But on the other hand, I'm asking you, perhaps, could you have been a, a your skills as, as, an, as a member of the audience? Could you, 
have, have looked at that experience in, in a different light. So two takeaways there. One is you don't have to worry about receiving because all you have to do is give and the receiving comes because it's giving and receiving are the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin. So if you got the receiving on the one side, well, all you have to think about is the giving because it's the same. So you just give and then you'll receive. So, so that, that's, and, and that's one thing. And okay, well, what, what, what do you ultimately want to receive? Well, obviously you're not going there to, to uh, make money. Uh, and if, if your ultimate goal is pleasure, well, I can think of more pleasurable ways to, you know, you can go get a massage or, you know, something that's more likely to, to you know, go, go walk, walk or go to a, a, a temple and just contemplate. No, you're going there to, to learn something and you're going to, to experience something. And so what are you experiencing? Okay, are, your expectations are to listen to, you know, music that you, you have an expectation how it sounds. But no, 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 that's not it. You're just there and what, am I, what can I learn from this? You know, what, what, what's, how can I leave this room with more knowledge, more understanding, more, how can I be one hour closer to my lifetime goal? Mm -hmm. Well, that's fair enough. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you you actually helped me think think uh, about my previous experience under a total, totally different light. I think that's that's really good, and I think that's very uh, just like inspired generosity. I think at the time I could not be that generous listener. At the time, I'll, I, I gotta be honest with myself here. But very good reflections, though. I really really appreciate that. I just want to go back to to two Yokoyama stories that are connected to, of course, your story as well. And one is I I remember reading somewhere that you invited Yokoyama sensei to spend some time with you in Hawaii when you were living there. And I think he was writing his book about Shakuhachi, right? His Shakuhachi biography or something like that. I just want to go back to that story because when I, I read that, I was just like, wow, I mean, how lucky right he is. I mean, you make an invitation, right? And a big teacher, a big performer, you know, like world-renowned performer, he comes and stays with you to teach you. And but at the same time, he just speaks a lot to his personality, right? To his character, the Okoyama's character, right? In terms of his generosity. I don't know. That's how, that's how I felt. But I'd love for you just to, to add, add some more color here for us. Okay. So first of all, yes, totally lucky. Wasn't my idea. It was Patricia's idea. And uh, I was always complaining. I, I, at that point, we were living in Hawaii and I would go back to Japan as often as as possible and have lessons and it would be sporadic once a year maybe occasionally twice a year but not very often and it was very frustrating for me and of course back then there's no such thing as zoom and um so patricia said well why don't you just ask him come over and teach you and i said forget that absolutely there's no way in the world that that would ever happen she said you don't know you don't know you don't know until you try. It's unlikely, admittedly. It's highly unlikely. <laughs> but you really don't know, you know, and, and, and that's true, you know, speaking purely in scientific terms. You don't know until you try it, right? Okay, and it was almost, she kept badgering me because I kept complaining. She didn't want to hear about my complaining. She wasn't doing, she, probably didn't, wasn't encouraging me primarily so that I could become a better shakachi player. She just wanted me to shut up, right? Quit whinging, okay? And I probably wrote to Yokoyama so that she would stop telling me, why don't you do it? <laughs> to prove to her that I was right, that he wouldn't do it. Now, it turned out that several things, again, Nothing to do with me. Total luck of the draw. He was writing this book. He was giving, doing a concert on the mainland United States. And back then, again, right time. Planes couldn't fly all the way from mainland United States to Japan. They had to stop in Honolulu to refuel. Th that didn't happen now. So I wrote him, and I didn't know he was 
going to have this concert coming up. I just wrote, wrote him, or concert tour in the States. You know, I know this is just an impossible, and I'm, I'm really almost kind of apologetic for even mentioning the idea, and uh, I totally understand if you can't do this, but, you know, I, I'd really like some intensive lessons for all. I wonder if you could stay in Honolulu for a bit. And Patricia was working um, in a travel agent. She could book um, these service departments, and she knew all the good ones in Waikiki. And she said, uh, I'll, I'll take care of that she, so I could offer you. I will book your uh, service department better in the hotel room and I'll provide you with all your meals. You know, I'll, I'll give you your breakfast. You can fix your own breakfast, but I'll take you out for lunch and, and dinner. Um, and I'll pay for your lessons. Right? Uh, would you be interested? And when you say, yeah, he was a generous person, but when you say, he, he wrote back, he said, yeah, this is perfect because I, I've almost finished with this book and I just can't because everyone keeps bothering me and I've always got stuff to do. And if I came to Hawaii, I wouldn't have to teach everybody. I'd just teach you and I'd only teach you as much as I wanted to, which would only be a couple of hours a day. I'd have the whole rest of the day on my own. Back then, there was no emails. There was no internet. There were phone calls that cost a lot of money. You weren't going to yeah. stay on the phone. So... He said, this is perfect for me. This would be like you providing me with this writer's retreat, uh, you know, a place to be, and Waikiki. And I was going to stop there anyway. So from his point of view, on an objective, not, not for, from, a, from an objective point of view, he wasn't being all that generous. It suited his situation. His needs. His needs. Everybody, it suited everybody's needs for that to happen. But wasn't I lucky? <laughs> oh, <bless. laughs> I was just so, so lucky. I was, it was just amazing. Here's another, just a little aside, nothing to do with what we're talking about. So by then, you know, we had cassette players. There was no, that was all you, that you could, well, we had open reel, but they were so huge. Anyway, so I had a cassette and I recorded he taught me maybe between um, maybe three hours, two one and a half hour sessions, sometimes only two, two hour sessions a day. And it was for about five, um, maybe six days, five or six days, less than a week. Uh, so, you know, I had, I don't know, 10 or 15 hours of cassette recordings at the end of it. And I never, ever listened to one of them ever again. Why? I think because I never had before, and I think because I had never relied on cassettes before, I never, maybe I missed things, but in retrospect, when you know you can't write it down and you have to remember it, mm. you listen more intently. This is very valuable, and I really, really need to remember this. I think this is one of the reasons why, in the past, people's memory was were better than, in you know, as a generalization, it is now. They would and not rely tradition. on gadgets for recording their experiences and whatsoever. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you, you know, the, the the total extreme is guys coming out of the the tour buses running quickly and taking lots of photographs and running back in the bus and then falling asleep so that they can watch all this stuff when they get home and not experiencing what's there at the time. I see. So, so oral traditions. So maybe I, I have missed, I did miss some things, but on the other hand, by my, um, not ever until then having had this, the tool one, I didn't know how to use it, so I never did. And secondly, I probably didn't think I needed it. Um, I don't know. And I don't have those recordings anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, I was gonna, it was going to be my next question. You still have those tapes. <laughs> wouldn't that be just, just a, wouldn't that be great? That yeah. would be great. I'd love to hear those, those sessions there and just see oh, what, dear, you, what, yeah, what he was yeah. teaching at that time. And if, yeah. you, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what, what, what year was that, Riley? Around what time? I don't even think it was in the... 
Well, maybe I started with Yokoyama, so it was the 80, early 80s. Early 80s? Yeah. If I started with him, it would, it would be, you know, it may have been 83, 84. Okay. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe even after that is, is the story of the, that cassette, I mean, that tuner thing. Maybe the next time it was in Japan. Or maybe it was just before that, I don't know. But it was all around that same time. We came to uh, to Sydney in 86, so it was obviously before that, because it was still in Hawaii. Mm. So it was sometime around 84, 83, 84, 85. No, that's great, thank you. And one, one last story here, because uh, also, I mean, we know we've been going for, for quite some time here, so I wanna kind of bring us to a close here shortly. But one, one last story that I heard, that at least that I heard from a Japanese bird, I would say, <laughs> is that uh, you are also in Japan so many times, I mean, students have the opportunity just to help their teachers doing concerts, right? And I think that there was this situation that I heard the story and I'd like you just to confirm if that's, that's how it went, that you were like with Yoko Emerson Sensei's, uh, you were in one of Yoko Emerson Sensei's concerts and you were taking care of his stuff for him. And Yoko Emerson Sensei was just like very well known to try to be, to constantly try to modify flutes, right? Just to change sounds and trying to, you know, make different, alterations in, in the bamboo try to get different tones and whatnot and i heard the story that he just put some paper inside the, the bamboo tube and and just before he entered the stage you you cleaned up his flute and then he was just saying something oh you clean up my flute and he said yes and then, oh do you know that i put some paper inside or was that it i mean if you, if you don't don't mind sharing that that little story because i thought i felt it was quite interesting from a, a student point of view <laughs> Yokoyama was always fiddling with his flutes and he destroyed most of them to the point where his father said, I'm not going to give you any more of my flutes because you just destroy them because he was, he was always trying to make them better. And one of the easiest ways to, um, to change the flute, you, you know, you change the bore either by adding or subtracting material. So he would either file away or and to add instead of adding, you know, stuff that takes a while to dry, a real quick way of adding things. You just get a, a piece of, literally one uh, thickness of a piece of paper, and if you wet it, or say a newspaper, a piece of newspaper, you know, the, a, a centimeter, square centimeter of newspaper, that alone will change how a shagachi will sound depending on where you put it. So you, know, you kind of ease it in place with a big long chopstick or something, and you put it there, and then it dries and sticks there, and so you can modify your shagachi that way. Uh, by adding. So he had this flute, he probably had filed it away, and he, yes, he had all these bits of paper, maybe five or six bits of paper throughout the flute in a way that he thought that was the best he could get that at that point. And then later on he would take that flute back and actually add the material in there. But he hadn't reached that point yet. And then he would later decide, no, I can do better, and then he'd eventually go so far and destroy the flute. But, and so I just swabbed the flute out for him you know, because his cleaning cloth was there. And he didn't react like you just said he did. He, he goes, you know, f completely freaked out. And, uh, as did everyone else that knew what happened, because there was other uh, people in the, in, the, in the dressing room too. And, and he was, I forget what he said. I was so aghast. You know, you can imagine what I was just, we were all speechless, basically. And, but he went out and played and he didn't sound any better or worse. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know the, 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 the level at which he was improving with his flute was probably only he could hear anyway. You know, mm. and he could feel it. You can feel when a flute plays well. Sometimes, you, you know, you can pick up a flute and I could pick up three flutes and I'll say, well, what do you think? And you'll say, well, they all sound the same. And I think, yeah, but I tried harder on these two. You know, I had to work harder. I can make it play well, but I didn't have to work so hard. Of course, you want to pick the flute that doesn't make you work so hard sometimes. Sometimes working hard is good. So in terms of the actual result, it didn't really matter. But in terms of that, that time, but, you know, he never really, he didn't get mad at me. You know, he didn't ban me from the, the <laughs> dressing room never again. There's another real quick little story about Yokoyama. Please. And this was, uh, now David uh, would know the, the name of this very famous Koto in, 
and um, Koto and Shamisen player, and I have forgotten her name. And that it, she famous. She was one of she was the living national treasure in her lineage at that point. And um, she was the 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 city was giving was um, um, sponsoring a, a, a concert in honor of her becoming living national treasure. And this was in um, Hiroshima or Okayama, somewhere down down there. And in this concert was all the other living national treasures. So, uh, you know, not living national, but all the guys top. So Yokoyama was there, Yamaguchi Goro was there, Yamamoto Hozan was there, Yokoyama was there, Aoki Reibo was there, Kawase was there, all the top guys in this one concert. And they, they did this, uh, a five-person shikanatone, which was quite interesting, you know, going around. That was amazing. But anyway, Yokoyama was in this one piece where she and her students were playing koto and shakachi, uh, shamisen. So there's like, you know, 30 shamisen players and 100 koto players, and he was the one shakachi player. So you really couldn't hear him, but you kind of could. But it was a very important gig, you know, obviously. And this is one, you know, he was there for. And... Um, he, it, they, they were cutting the pieces, so he, he uh, you know, several hours beforehand, he, he said, oh, Riley, could you go out and to the local uh, heart, um, stationery store? I need, you know, scissors and, and uh, cellotape um, and um, a, a marker, a highlighter. So I went out and got that, and he cut up his score and then taped it together and highlighted so that he, instead of a lot of turning pages, he had it all on one. And so then he... You know, we did, and he did it, and it was fine, and we were talking, and then he went on stage, we were playing, and, you know, you could, couldn't hear him that well, but you could see at one point that he, he, first of all, you could see he kind of frowned, and, you know, you don't know whether he's, what's happening, because, you know, people, they, they play like that, and they, what, is it frowning, or is it, it's not grimacing, you're just really into your flute or whatever, but it just seemed something a little different, he was still doing things, and he, and anyway, the piece ended, and, and uh, he came back, and, and he goes, <laughs> I said, you know, well, not I, someone else. You know, I was just listening in on. He said, I, I taped it wrong. Oh my God. <laughs> and so suddenly, <laughs> playing along, and suddenly he's no longer where he's supposed to be. And so the rest of it was just kind of partly his memory, but it was one of these really fast pieces that, and unlike, you know, David. Uh, Wheeler and, and, and Christopher, they can memorize these pieces, as can now a lot of people. Back then, well, Yokoyama didn't. He had to read the score. And so that was, that was a funny thing. Uh, you know, it was, we all make mistakes, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. Well, no, thank you. Thank you so very much. I mean, very interesting story for us. Just again, to get some more perspective on, on Yokoyama's Sensei in general. As we get to our, our our close here or at the end of our interview today, I just want to ask you maybe one or two final questions. So one, I mean, if you could summarize your key learnings from your Yokoyama Sensei, I mean, what do you keep close to heart after everything you shared with me today, you know, your beautiful, amazing, lucky journey as well with him, but what do you keep close to heart? Uh... Probably a, a sense of generosity is one, and the idea that technique is, is um, you, you can never get too good at technique. What you do, do as well as you can, and you can never do as well as you, you can in the future. So always continue to work on doing the best you can. You do the best you can today, but don't be satisfied with that. It should be better tomorrow. If it's not, that's okay too. But you're always striving to always improve. So always improve and, and be generous. And when I say, you know, if you're not better tomorrow, that's okay. The reason you can say that is you have, to, one has to be generous not only with everybody, but you have to be generous with yourself too. Mm -hmm. You know, you. I make mistakes. That's okay, Riley. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> you know, it's okay. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I said, oh, but it was so bad. And yeah, that's fine. You have to be, yeah, so that was the two. High goals, high goals, generosity. Great, thank you. 
And uh, lastly, any final words for us, I would say like 21st century Shakuhachi players, people that would never have a chance to meet the greats, you know, as, as you did, as many other people did, but we're like living under different circumstances. We're learning from Zoom and Skype and whatnot, but anything that you'd like to, to share as a, as a general advice for people learning Shakuhachi uh, nowadays and also trying to move forward. I'll, I'll share another story, and this is with Yamamoto, Yamamoto Hozan. I've always admired his playing too, and I always wanted to sound like him as well. And um, there was one piece in particular that I just thought, man, I, if I could play like that, I would just go die and go to heaven. And then I, I found out back then in the recording studio, you could, you could do things like add reverb. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. And that his, uh, what I was listening to was his playing in a, a, it was a recording that they added reverb to and they changed the sound and they made it better. So I was striving to play even better than he could play. So, you know, just that, that's, I was very lucky to be ignorant of that, you know. So, a lot of things you don't know what you're getting into until you do it. And if you knew what you know now, you'd never start. I think that's true of parenthood. You know, that's true of so many things, you know. So if you really want to, uh, to, for example, make a living playing the shakuhachi, well, just decide to do it and, and do the best you can. Do what you need to do to do it. and. Um, you know, if, if, it, if you always have to work, then that's okay. You're working in order to do your shakuhachi. You're sleeping in order to do your shakuhachi. You're eating in order to do your shakuhachi. You're not eating that junk food in order to do your shakuhachi. You are eating that healthy food in order to do the shakuhachi. Everything is focused toward what you want to do. Um, and if you, that is difficult for you, well, then maybe you don't want to become a, a shakuhachi player. Maybe you want to do something that, that doesn't require that sort of focus. Fantastic. Again, thank you so very much. I uh, really appreciate the time together. I have no words to express my gratitude here, but really thank you. In the bottom of my heart, I'm, I'm really touched and moved by so many things you shared today. So, Riley Sensei, thank you so very much for the time here speaking about your shakuhachi journey in Yokoyama Sensei and Takahashi in general. Appreciate well, it. Well, it's, it's, it's very easy for me to just kind of waft on and, you know, talk about myself and my, my uh, memories and, and uh, so forth. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to indulge <laughs> in my ever-growing faulty memory. So I, I appreciate that too. Well, Thank you. my pleasure. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.